Um, okay, well, let me go ahead and, and pray in the way that I always do, and then we'll get started. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, again, um, the monthly theme is living a life of love and obedience. And so that's what I'm going to be addressing this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about love generally, and then I'm going to talk about love in the context of, of actually romantic love or married love. And that's the part where my wife would tell you that I'm especially expert. Um, but I'm, I'm doing it kind of as an example of the way that Christian love works itself out tangibly uh, in a Christian life. And, um, but let me back up a little bit before I get started with that. What we're really talking about today is just what it means to be a disciple. I mean, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? There are many different ways to describe sort of the object or the goal of discipleship. For instance, we could say that whenever one encounters Jesus Christ and begins to follow him, there's a process wherein we have to sort of learn to give ourselves up. Uh, giving ourselves up means coming increasingly not only to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord or Master, but then living as though he were the master, okay? Um, and so sort of being mastered by Jesus is one of the goals of discipleship. In fact, it's one of the most difficult things about the Christian life is the fact that we can never master it. It's really a process of being mastered. Um, and and we, we're not necessarily geared towards um, a life of being mastered. That is the thing. We might also say that becoming um, a Christian or a disciple is... is a process of coming into knowledge of God, learning to actually know God, um, not only intellectually, but experientially, you know. And you can only really know somebody deeply if you're able to listen to them, if you're able to take their advice, you know, um, if you can empathize with them. Um, knowing, incidentally, and this, this is a completely different lecture, but knowing in Scripture um, is, is always relational. Uh, it's not just intellectual. And so in the Hebrew, for instance, the word yada is actually used of sexual relationships, like Adam knew his wife, uh, for instance. Um, uh, or in, the, in, in 1 John, if you know God, then you will love, and if you don't love, then you don't know God, because there's more to love than just sort of intellectual um, comprehension. We could also say um, that becoming a disciple is a process of becoming a citizen in the kingdom of God, which is coming, you know? Um, the kingdom of God is coming. Um, Jesus Christ is our sovereign Lord. And so what does it mean to live um, under this coming Lord as a citizen in the kingdom which will be everlasting? We could also say, and there's many, many things we could say, um, we could say that becoming a disciple is a process of becoming more holy, um, more holy. And not holy just in the sense of avoiding certain things, um, but having one's life directed in a certain way. That's what the process of sanctification is. Um, it is ultimately, and now I'm getting to my point this morning, it's a process of learning to love. And from the beginning of the church until now, um, Christians have affirmed this truth, that becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ is learning to love. Um, it's learning to be turned outwards. Uh, the reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, Thomas Cranmer and all of those guys, said that the problem with humanity is that we are homo incurvitas, which means we, we have been curved in um, uh, towards ourselves, and we no longer know how to be properly open towards others, um, those with whom we are most close in our lives, but also with God. Um, and so loving, learning to love is a process of learning to be um, to have turned back outward to the other uh, in our life. So that's what I really want to address this morning. First, this biblical theme, um, love, and the way that it operates in the Christian life. And so I'm going to read a couple of exemplary passages, which you guys are most likely familiar with, from the scriptures, uh, and then I will move on from there. And so we probably all know Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. This is the famous um, Shema. Uh, and actually, in the Hebrew, the passage begins, Shema O Israel. Um, Shema is just a word for here. Okay? Uh, and so here's what the Hebrews are told 
to do or how to live. This is how they're told to live after they receive the law. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, you are to love God. And what does loving God mean? Well, it means coming to know his law, his word, so much so that you write it on your hand, you know, you stick it on your forehead, you stick it on your kids' foreheads, um, uh, and your wife's forehead, and you become a people who are truly sort of obsessed because you're sort of swimming in an ocean of God's word. It is to be what you call ubiquitous. Kind of like social media is for us. You know, imagine, uh, imagine sort of replacing social media um, with the uplifting, life-giving word of God so that it's sort of the, the air we breathe and the, the, the water we swim in. That's what this passage is saying. We all know um, that when Jesus is asked by the scribes, what is the greatest law? Here's what he says. Uh, well, here's first what the scribe says. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus says, you know, these two commands, first of all, love God, and then love your neighbor as yourself, are a summary of the entire Old Testament. Everything of substance that is told there can be encapsulated um, in these two particular commands. That's a big deal. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, Paul writes to the church at Colossae, for bearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. So what Paul is saying to the church, to this young church is, you are to be a community which is characterized by and known for its love. And the way that that love is going to be expressed is not in the perfection of all of the people, because you're going to mess up. It's going to be expressed primarily in the first part of this command, which is, you have been forgiven, so you must forgive. Okay? And so that is what this community is sort of glued together by, is the mutual forgiveness. First of all, being grateful for the forgiveness we have received, and then extending this forgiveness to others over and over and over again. And any of you guys who have spent much time in a church um, uh, or had any good friends, okay, know that this is true. You guys with me here? Okay. This is the this is among the most distinctive characteristics of the Christian church. We're not an affinity group. You know, we're not we're not tied together by our political allegiances or by our you know uh, common love of the Cleveland Browns or um, uh, or whatever. Um, not ethnically. Um, we're we're bound together by the forgiveness we have received and the forgiveness we extend. And it allows us to be a diverse group under God. And then, of course, um, one of the many passages in 1 John, uh, which I was referring to a moment ago, uh, John writes, beloved let, us, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And that's a really, that's a, that's a terribly frightening passage, okay? Um, uh, if you want to know how you're doing in your Christian life, then think about these things, the forgiveness you have received and, and the extent to which you're willing and able uh, uh, to offer forgiveness to others. Um, how are you doing with other people? You know, how are you doing with your family and your friends? Um, how close are you to God? It's asking the same question. Uh, I'm going to actually end this lecture by suggesting um, that this is so important for a number of reasons. For one, we can know God 
not like any other object in the universe, because God is not an object in the universe. God is the one in whom we live and breathe and have our being. So the way that we know this God is always from the inside. He's our Father. We don't even know God like we know another person. Um, God is the maker of all things. And what Scripture tells us over and over again is that we know God as our lives are assimilated to Him. And that happens primarily through love. Okay? Uh, uh, we, we are made in His image, and we love as He loves. Then we know Him in a deeply intimate way. We're sort of drawn into His own heart, which again in the Gospel of John is what John says happens here. Um, so, love is important. Okay? Um, the goal of discipleship is to love. Uh, the glue that holds the church together is this love. There's a problem, however. Um, if love is important, um, and if love is love, then what is love? Okay. Now that, that's purposely confusing, okay? um, because it is confusing. We're all messed up in this particular culture about love. Uh, I'm talking about it right now, but the word itself has lost its meaning. It's used in all kinds of ways. So I've got a question for you guys. Can you think of some simple ways that we use the word love in our culture? Um, what do you think? How do, how do you, like if you're just talking to your family or friends, this word love is probably used more than you realize. Um, what are some of the ways we might use it? I love your shoes. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got great shoes. I've got a broken one, so I, anyway, I'll, I won't go on and on about this, but thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, what else? Yeah, good. Food. I love uh, Mexican food. <coughs> yeah. uh, I love pizza. You know. Uh, yeah, we say it as food. What else? Do, how else do we say it? Sports teams. Yeah. Um, maybe the Cleveland Browns. Who knows? Maybe something else. You guys get the picture, though. We we use the word in all kinds of ways. We love friends. We love our wives. We love our fellow Christians. We love God. These are not all the same thing. You know, loving pizza is not the same thing as loving my wife. Um, loving my wife is not exactly the same thing as loving God. Um, these, these things are different. And so what does the word love mean exactly? Uh, it's kind of important. One of the phrases that we hear often in our culture today is love is love. You guys heard that before? Um, without getting too political, it's commonly used, and it's utterly meaningless. Okay, It's utterly meaningless. <laughs> Um, it just doesn't mean anything. Uh, we need to distinguish okay, what what is what love is love, uh, and what kind of love is love. Uh, well, you know, um, well, I'm going to clarify everything today. <laughs> um, but we we do have a problem in our culture with the fact that the word love has lost much of its meaning because it's not specified enough. Fortunately, um, in other languages, there are multiple words for love which have specific meanings. And it helps us very much to know what those specific meanings are. Uh, and so that's really what I want to talk about uh, over the next 20 or 30 minutes. And so in the Greek language um, of our New Testament, we find three kinds of what we call natural love. They are, first of all, storge, which we might um, say is something like affection. It's just a very natural kind of affection um, that we feel. Usually, we can use this word for describing family, um, our very close friends, you just, you can't help yourself, you know what I mean? Like, with our family, you can't help, well, that depends. <laughs> but, like, a, with a, if you're a parent and you've got kids, uh, or if you're a child and you have parents, which most, most people do, um, you can't help it, for the most part. Storge. Another is phileo, uh, which just means friendship. You know, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. And then finally, eros, which is romantic passion. Um, so none of these loves in the Greek are what we call ultimate. They're very just natural loves. None of them is eternal. All humans do that. None of them is self-sustaining. Without divine love to aid them, we experience these forms of love as longing, which can never be satisfied. Um, and if, we really, if you stopped and really thought about that for a minute, you'd find that it is true. Um, we, have, we have longings in this life which really can never be satisfied. We're, we're, we're driven by our desires to a, very, to a very large extent. In the words of C.S. Lewis, love, having become a god, becomes a demon. So if we have these natural kinds of love, and they are not properly sort of ordered or directed, or if they are not accompanied by 
the proper gifts or virtues or fruits of the Spirit, then they can they can ruin our lives, okay? And they, they actually do ruin our lives um, if we don't know how to love right. So what I want to talk about is the fact that Sturge, uh, Phileo, and Eros, without agape, which is the fourth kind of love. How many of you guys have heard the word agape before? Most of you know this, yeah. You know that agape is love. It's the, it's the kind of love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I have this read in my wedding, many other people have as well. It's beautiful, uh, and it's of course true. Agape is a self-sacrificial kind of love. It is, the, it is divine love, um, and divine love will actually order all of the other loves uh, and make them such that they can actually lead you into the fulfillment for which you were created. Uh, that's what Christians have always claimed. So, Sturge, Phileo, and Eros, without a God, they become disordered, corrupt, and frustrating. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit more uh, about how that looks with each one of these laws. Okay? So let's talk about Sturge. <clears throat> um, Sturge is a simple and very natural affection. It is what we might call the most humble form of love. It doesn't require much of us, it's just natural. We can describe it as the pleasure we feel in the company of someone we enjoy, and it's best exemplified in familial relationships. And so, um, again, if you're a parent, it's especially easy to understand this because your kids just kind of are on your mind, they're a burden to you, you know? Kids are a burden, um, and that burden is itself uh, characteristic of or, or evidence of this natural affection that you have for them. However, um, Sturge can be disordered, and it can be corrupted, and it is for all of us to a certain degree. None of us loves this way perfectly, okay? Um, but there are examples which are more obvious than others, and so my question for you guys is, what do you think disordered Sturge might look like in a parental relationship? How does it go wrong? Uh, you, could, you could confess, you know, how it's going on for you, or you could give examples which are merely theoretical. Expectations. Uh, you, expectations. Expectations of your kids. You might, yeah, you might have expectations of your kids which are unfair, uh, in which they wear as a burden, uh, and can cause issues. Yeah. yeah. I think it could um, be a part of them being rejection on either party, but then also then abuse. Abuse, yeah. Because when Boundaries are not set. Yeah. Yeah, any kind of abuse, physical abuse or, or emotional abuse, um, uh, no control of a parent, uh, you're, you're, you're transgressing a kind of natural law. You know? <clears throat> Whatever affection is, and I'm going to get to this actually, uh, true human affection, true, true story, true sort of human affection is only properly exercised within the context of agape. And, we, and when we see it, and we see it not exercised in that way, we know something's wrong. Like, you know, you know, if you're a child and your parent uh, is imposing expectations on you that they shouldn't be, or if, that, if, a child, if, a, if a parent is manipulating you, you know there's something wrong there. Why? Why, Why is that? Well, it's because there's a certain way uh, which we should be living. What do you guys think about this? Other examples. Overindulgence. Overindulgence, not disciplining your child. And, and out of weakness or fear, that's hard. That's hard. Uh, yeah. Dan. Overprotecting. Overprotection. Yeah, uh, which is a kind of sort of controlling, but um, we, we want to shelter our kids. Um, yeah, I was actually watching a, a YouTube video of Jordan Peterson talking about this just, just the other day, actually, um, uh, about the way that we have to let our kids take risks, um, that we are really harming them. In fact, if we don't, and, and I think that's right. Yeah. Any, anybody else? The juxtaposition of relationships. How do we do? Like a change in relationship. Like a parent is needy of a child, um, which you often see. Uh, a parent uh, is sort of fulfilling some emotional need and using the child and forcing that child to play a role that the child should not have to play. Yeah, there, there's a million ways in which um, parents or others can, can fail, okay? And we all do fail at some point, you know, to, to a certain extent. And so, unfortunately, kids have to show their parents a little bit of grace. Um, which is probably why it's one of the, uh, it's, it's, it's number six in the commandments, right? Are your father and mother. Um, no, is it number four? Come on, guys. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's one hour, okay? It's, it's four. The first, the first four. Are, no, it's got to be five. Actually, the first four are about. Yeah. The first four are about our relationship with God, and the second. The second six. Right? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there was. You guys know that they cannot find referees for kids basketball games these days. Um, uh, like it's a growing problem. My son, when he was in high school, uh, got his referee license, and so he would, he would. He would referee kids' basketball games, and these were like you know three to five year olds, um, and the and the parents were so awful uh, and abusive that he couldn't stand it. He did it for a couple of seasons, and he's he like, I'm never doing that again. You know, um, it's evidently become a crisis in our culture. They just cannot find referees for pee wee leagues. Um, now that suggests um, a massive crisis of stewardship. You know. What in the world is the matter with us if we, if we are so messed up that our affection for our kids requires us um, to have expectations of everyone else uh, to treat them in a particular way? You know, they must be sort of coddled um, uh, and entitled um, uh, to all these things. And, and this is a good example, and there are many others. Um, when I was, well, that was my last one. I lived in Texas, I'm from Texas. Um, it's probably been 20 years ago now, there was a mother in Texas who hired a hitman to kill her daughter's um, nearest competition in a cheerleading trial. You guys hear about this? In National League. Okay. <laughs> that is, that is Storge um, gone out of control. But it is rightly described as Storge, disorder, Storge. Okay? All right. Um, we can go on and on with all of these. Let's talk about filet. Um, brotherly love or friendship. And um, of course, in the famous, you know, I grew up in the 80s and, well, 70s and 80s, and it was a young adult in the 90s. I'm actually about the same age as these guys, and so on Thursday nights, and you guys may remember, it was always Seinfeld and Friends in ER. You guys remember this? Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, so there's some great phileo love going on in Friends, and there's some pretty messed up uh, phileo going on um, as well. C.S. Lewis explains it in his book, The Four Loves, this way. He says, Friendship arises out of mere companionship. When two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest, or even taste which the others do not share, and which until that moment each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. And so, like affection, um, phileo or brotherly love arises very naturally in natural interactions. When we, you know, like when we moved to Ohio, our um, the friendships we made, almost all the friendships that we made were with other parents whose kids were in the same athletic events as, as, as ours, you know, or, um, or people at church, or people, you know, my colleagues at work, or, or Suzanne's colleagues at work. This is just the way friendship works. Um, you, you, it's, it's natural, uh, it's easy. When you've got something in common and you're working together on some project, um, or you see each other on a regular basis, uh, this kind of love just arises. Uh, however, it can be corrupted. And so, can you think of any examples? How could brotherly love go astray? Would be this one. Jealousy. Jealousy, yeah. Yeah. Um, which can manifest in all kinds of diabolical ways in a friendship. You know, it can be kind of hidden or subversive, um, it can be out of life. Yeah. Competition. Competition, yeah. Um, Right. We, why can't you desire the good of your brother or sister? Um, Overattachment. Codependence. Codependence um, is a big one. Yeah. Some friend who must fulfill deep insecurities or deep needs that you have, um, uh, which is unfair to that friend because they, they, that's not their role. It turns into misplaced eros love. I didn't hear that. Like if it's misplaced romantic love. Yeah, um, you mean like, like um, becoming romantically attached to a friend who is just a friend? Yeah. 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 Any others? Abuse. Uh, yeah, abuse. Um, bullying uh, is kind of abuse. Gossip can be a kind of abuse. Um, just abuse can be, you know, abuse, uh, physical abuse. Absolutely. Uh, 
from. You ever know of, I mean, I, I have um, not, like, I've ever personally experienced anything like this, but you ever know of a group of friends who were, were sort of gathered around some kind of wickedness? And by wickedness, I just mean, like, let's say it's gossip, you know. Um, uh, you know, a group of friends who like to get together and tear other people apart. Um, I've known groups like that, and I've known groups like that, and I've seen that when one member of the group didn't like to participate in the tearing apart of some other person, then they were an outcast in the group, right? Um, uh, because they, they weren't sort of indulging that particular vice. Maybe you can think of um, friends who, who genuinely, uh, friendships which are sort of gravitationally centered on some true vice, heavy drinking, you know, or gambling, or gosh, there's a million things. There's, you know, friendship groups can arise for all kinds of reasons, which are very similar to good friendships. It can just be some terrible thing you like to do that this other person happens to like to do. And so in liking to do it together, you become friends, but that friendship is never happy. Uh, it's never happy. Uh, for one thing, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, more recently, I've noticed more and more that happening on the political levels. Like yeah. groups, in groups, forming of like, yeah. um, strong dissatisfaction and resentment and grieving that. Together. Yeah. It's you find a group of people who have something in common, and what might what they might have in common is some rage or hatred, right? Um, absolutely, absolutely. And um, it's a good example because rage and hatred, or perhaps some vice which is being indulged, is never good for anyone. And so, if you are not only um, sort of gravitate gravitating towards that yourself, but you want other people to be equally sort of engaged in that hatred or that vice, then you can't possibly love that person, because that's not good for that person. Um, and so it's a failure on a number of levels. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thinking back on that, like, friendships, like you're saying, coming together and then developing within groups, like a pecking order or gaslighting or, you know, it becomes like cultish, because whether it be on different pieces, like the, you can't leave the group if you don't want to participate, and if not, then you become a target. Or you know, on the other side, it's like if you want to be a part of this group, then you have to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that's right. And or you know, as you're saying, just not allowing the ability to have um, the independence of each person being their own to enjoy the main thing being unite. Yeah, um, that, and that truly is, is phileo disorder um, because that's peer pressure, right? I mean, that's what peer pressure is. Peer pressure is a true expression of phileo. It's just, it's just a disordered, corrupted uh, form of this very natural law. All right, um, I think we all, we all get that. Um, eros, I know we're going to have a hard time coming up with examples of this, but <laughs> just bear, bear with me, okay? Um, Here's what Lewis writes about it before loves. And maybe you agree with this or maybe you don't, but here's what he says. He says, when the two people who thus discover that they are on the same secret road are of different sexes, the friendship which arises between them will very easily pass, may pass in the first half hour into erotic love. Um, indeed, unless they are physically repulsive to each other, or unless one or both already loves elsewhere, it is almost certain to do so sooner or later. In Lewis's opinion, if you take a man and a woman and you rub them together, then you've got, you know, it's as, it's as easy and as natural as that, which may or may not be true. Uh, perhaps it may not. Um, but it's, again, a very natural thing. We have simply been created for this kind of passion, um, and it will be a part of our lives. It's a part of everyone's life. Uh, however, as you know, uh, it can be corrupted. So what would Eros look like if it were corrupted and disordered. Like a my brain. Yeah. <laughs> Have we ever seen any examples that were not? <laughs> we don't see them publicly, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but shout some out. What, what, are, what are some examples? Pornography. Pornography. Yeah, pornography is, is um, a, a, such a good example of homo incorruptus, of being sort of turned in on oneself, um, seeking pleasure in, in oneself. Yeah. Casual sex or do you just for fun? Yeah, making sex into a recreational activity, which is what it has become since the sexual revolution. 
Um, uh, that, that's what sex is like an entitlement. Uh, it's recreational activity, and um, reducing sex to that has done horrible damage to our world. Why, why do you think it's been so easy, by the way, to uh, reduce sex to a recreational activity? I'm getting a little bit controversial. Here. They've separated it from the sacred. Separating. Sacred. We, we have evacuated of any sacred symbol that we have. Um, it's about the me culture. It's all about me. My, 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 my wants, my desires, and mine. Yeah, self gratification um, is. If self gratification is sort of the goal of life, then why wouldn't we apply that to the sexual yeah. Um I would suggest a part of this kind of is that is the, the ability of natural contraception on abortion. Uh, I'm not opposed to contraception, but we have not properly dealt with the effects of it. Okay, um, it has fundamentally changed the way our whole culture thinks about sex, um, because sex has been separated from procreation, um, which is a, a part of the sort of sacred nature of sexuality itself. And uh, this is something we rushed into without, like so many technologies. Um, it comes with, with positives and negatives, uh, and, and often we fail utterly to deal with the negative consequences of, of technologies which we embrace, and this is a really good example. Uh, yeah? Could, could these, uh, that be... I'm not saying, but I'm sorry. I'm not saying there's a good to abortion. Okay, well, I actually am not saying that. But, no, I don't. Okay, could these then be symptoms of what is the bottom line, the freedom of the individual, I'm not sure I understand your question. What you're talking about, uh, uh, abortion, uh, recreational sex, and so on. Yeah. Uh, uh, the bottom line is the freedom of the individual. That's right. You is say, that, is, is, are those the symptoms of that philosophy? Or well, they're the symptoms of, um, this is, I think I know what you're saying. You're, you're, they are perhaps symptoms of a, mistaken understanding of what freedom is. Um, Christians, Christian philosophers distinguish between what we call freedom from and freedom for. Um, and so there's a freedom for excellence or for virtue or for flourishing. And we have kind of made freedom nearly freedom from, like freedom from any kind of external control. It's a, it's a kind of radical autonomy or independence where we want nobody telling us what to do. Whereas the biblical notion of freedom is to be able to actually fulfill the responsibilities that God has naturally ordained for us. Um, uh, which is a kind of freedom. And so I, I, is that kind of what you get at? Yeah. 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 That's right. Good. Anybody else? Um, it's easy to see, okay? Abusive relationships, codependent relationships, um, uh, honors, you know, um, sexual love can be wildly distorted, disordered. All right. Um, so, as I have been describing, all of the above loves are corruptible, and they can be perfected or properly ordered by grace. Agape, then, uh, which is Christian sacrificial love, it's what Jesus demonstrated on the cross, um, a, a self-giving kind of a love, is a theological virtue. Okay? It is actually something that can, that can, be, can become a part of our fiber. Okay? We, we can actually become the kinds of people for whom self-giving is somewhat natural, you know, we can, and that, and that can have an influence on all of our lives, that's the point. So it's a theological virtue by which we love God for God's own sake, not making of him some kind of idol to serve us, you know, which is what idolatry is. So we love God for God's own sake, actually knowing him, hearing him, serving him, loving him, above all else, but also all others in God. If you know who God is, and if you know who other people are, then what you want more than anything in the world is for other people to love God, okay? Because they find their own flourishing in doing so. Um, uh, their, their sort of souls have been properly directed in that way. And here's that passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Paul writes, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. 
Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But love, of course, doesn't pass away. And the reason it doesn't is because we can only truly love, truly give of ourselves, um, uh, insofar as we have been conformed to God in Christ. If we, we become what C.S. Lewis says, even if to an infinitesimal um, uh, degree, little Christ, okay? Um, we're everlasting because God is love. So agape, then, is a gift of grace, and it's also a matter of the will. Um, we can become the kinds of people who truly love um, if, in fact, we allow God's grace to work in ourselves. Um, when we do that, then we begin to love as God loves other human beings and to will as God wills. You know, we become the kinds of people for whom the promises of the gospel motivate our lives uh, and direct uh, our actions. Um, all right. So, agape, then, we would say, gives form to human virtues and capacities, and it orders them to their ultimate end in God. So, here's what we want to say. Uh, what would the four loves look like properly ordered by grace in a God? And again, this is an easy exercise. So storge, uh, affection which is best exemplified in family relationships, what does it look like, just very simply, for a parent to truly love their child? How would we describe it? Proper discipline. Proper discipline. For, towards what end? Why do we put discipline? Toward the... Uh themselves. Yeah, to, we, we will, and this is hard, it's a burden, and I'm a parent too, we, we actually, if we truly love our kids, then their own growth in love and holiness uh, and discipleship should be a burden to us. Um, and we, you know, if you've got kids like I do who are adults, um, you know how hard this is. You, know, you, you, you should, and I'm sure you, you sort of feel the burden like I do. You want your kids to love God. You want your kids to become Christians. And you know how um, difficult that is in this life, but um, yeah, it's it, it means you will want your kids to, to grow to be more Christ-like. Um, and so, it would certainly include caring for them. It would, it would include um, avoiding all the ways that you, you might abuse that that natural affection. And it would, it would entail a kind of natural ordering of your relationship with that child, or that adult child, um, so that um, you are you are deciding them by helping them out. Let me fix this. I'm not sure what happened. I lost my connection. There we go. All right. So. Um, the parent who loves the child for the child's own good and seeks to form them in the love of God known through the Christian story. Um, unfortunately, we have our whole lives to, to do this, you know. And, um, I, although what we do with young children is very, very important. Very important. Good. Um, how about filet or brotherly love? How, um, how can it be properly ordered by a doctor? What are some good examples? Yeah, same thing. It's, it's really easy, right? We, we, uh, and we don't have to, you know, if, if all you do in all your relationships is sort of, you know, well, what would you call it? Uh, sort of like be obnoxious about God. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, preach. There you go. Yeah. That is not what should characterize our relationships at all. Um, uh, it should certainly be more natural and more subtle than that. You know, we should genuinely love them, not be wanting to control them or manipulate them or see a uh, 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 she's a little jacket, right? Yeah, dude. There, there are times when you can uh, seize an opportunity to actually be a mentor or helping a person help you. <laughs> not be overbearing, not looking at yeah. you. You need to answer questions and draw. Yeah. Absolutely. Help, help with order. It, and it should happen naturally, you know? If we truly love someone and we have a friend, certainly our, our relationship with that friend is not going to be sort of centered around some vice or some common pursuit that's not good for either one of us. We'll love them and we'll enjoy their company, right? Uh, and we will want them to be growing. Uh, and certainly, our relationship with Christ will play in, if necessarily, will play in because 
Um, we believe in the believers, and we believe what could be better than for this person. Um, but it'll be natural and subtle, uh, and but it'll also be intentional. So we're thinking about it in, in, the, in the context of this relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mentorship sorry. or even just a friendship based on mutually pushing each other. Absolutely. Yeah. With many of our friends, especially if they're Christian friends, then there should be accountability towards one another and, and mutual care. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, if you don't cheat, if your friend is not a Christian, right? Uh, they have no interest, then you probably still will stick with the person. You can still be a genuine friend, wanting their best, you know, um, but knowing even what the limits are of your, your ability to preach to them or whatever. You know, you can still be a friend. Um, and, and you can certainly avoid corrupting them uh, or, or engaging in um, activities which are, are, are bad for both of you. So any friendship which seeks the good of the other, life of union with God is the ultimate goal. Um, but we have to do so with wisdom and patience and, um, and forgiveness and grace. You know, many relationships require a tremendous amount of grace and Christians should have it. Um, how about eros, okay, romantic passion uh, or love? What, is, what does this look like when it is properly ordered by a God? Serving. Serving your partner. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, like, again, wanting the best for them. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a, uh, a way of sharing intimacy that is that reflects agape. It's not just you know, being close or physical close, but that intimate you know, right. a shared sort of sense. Men and women are different. You guys notice this? <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, even I suspect, I can only speak from one side, but even the way that men and women experience sexual sexual relationships is different. And each is a challenge to the other, right? Um, yeah, I'm going to need your shirt. John Gray, my that's, that's about 20 okay. years ago now. Good, yeah. yeah. I've never read it, but I, I just somehow I know. You know? Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going on 30 years here. I actually, I some students the other day I was talking to. One of the students said something like, you know how, I, I would imagine when you're married, you, know, you just know exactly what the other person is thinking all the time. And to a certain degree, that's true, but I said, no, no, that's, not, that's really not the case. It might just because I'm an idiot, but you know, I'm not, I'm not um, But certainly it was the case that, um, that the sex is a challenge one another. Uh, and a part of the reason, I'm going to get to this in a minute, why um, the Christian view of marriage absolutely requires a man or a woman is because of what we call the, um, the, I have a word for it, I can't remember right now, but, um, but just the difference between them. Um, uh, with the sexual distinctions and the, and the sexual, emotional, physiological uh, differences between them um, are complementary in a way that same sex marriage can't be complementary. Again, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but we challenge each other more uh, in heterosexual relationships. Uh, at, at, at far deeper levels, I would suggest. And this is something that you'll, you'll certainly see um, in, in the Catholic Christian literature. By Catholic, I just mean the really old stuff, okay? Um, pre, pre Reformation. Uh, but again, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, what else? How, what else? Yeah. I think in the Paris love, partnership love, is um, maybe you guys your Yeah, and we should note that there are many ways wherein the traditional heterosexual marriage can be really dysfunctional. You know, even if all appearances would make it seem as though it was not, you can think of and here I'm offering a character. But you can think of sort of the 1950s marriage where you've got the working man and, and the sort of woman who stays at home, and um, he wants her to look attractive all the time, the house to be kept neat, you know, and to sort of 
um, uh, shine and sort of help him get ahead socially. Um, you know, the woman on a pedestal kind of a thing. Um, this is a way in which the man might objectify the woman uh, and, and kind of have an objective sort of picture of the way she wants to be in relation to him. Likewise, she could be objectifying him. You know, he must be the sort of provider um, uh, who fulfills a sort of societal um, expectation uh, so that together they're, they're, they're both objectifying one another in such a way that is very sort of common and attractive to the culture, but truly is lacking in God. Does that make sense to you guys? Whereas the biblical portrait is one um, wherein men and women were created with distinction, differences, um, and those differences are truly complementary. So that we can never go into a relationship with another romantically thinking we know in advance what we must get out of that relationship. Does that make sense to you? you know what I mean? you know, we, we can't objectify thinking, she will gratify these particular needs, and she will fulfill these expectations, and she is thinking, he will gratify these particular needs, but it will most likely be more emotional than physical for the woman, from what I, from what I hear. And I know that, that there's, <laughs> there's degrees of this stuff. Um, but the two can be objectifying uh, each other. Uh, but the Christian view, again, is that we, we are not supposed to do that. We enter into a relationship loving and serving and wanting to give and waiting for the other to sort of reveal the gifts they have been created to give. Does that make sense to you? Um, uh, and so there's a kind of posture of expectation and humility that is to characterize even romantic relationships. Um, and all of this is the stuff that is so hard to practice, uh, but I think is a part of the beauty of the way that God has made uh, human beings. I think learning, um, learning to love, even yeah. with not just biblical, not just of course biblical exhortation, but also there's a lot of resources for couples yeah. to learn about one another and how to learn about one another. Classically, the five love languages right. is a simple one. How uh, filling the love tank, yeah. you know, those kinds of things. Those kinds of things, learning together. How to um, grow in a relationship with a married couple. I think that is how Eros can be. Um, it's like, yeah, what a gift it is. Yeah, and it, it, that's great. It needs to, our, our relationship to our spouse needs to be intentional. Um, like everything else in our life, it should grow. Just among all three, like having a proper hierarchy and not letting, say, like love for your children become more important than love for your right. spouse, right. or letting love for your spouse be more important than love for God. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and the, the classic, there is this is when we talk about disordering loves, classically, uh, again, we're supposed to have God as the ultimate love, um, and then there is a kind of proper order for all of these loves. Um, to learn to balance them, um, not letting them get out of order. Because any love that is out of order becomes a kind of idolatry. Yeah, Dan. I, I don't want to steal this from you if you're headed. No, I was just going to observe that in every case, the, one of the ways in which agape informs all of these other kinds of love is through a posture of long suffering. That's right. Yeah. That's fundamental. That's right. And you, I mean, you, can, you can articulate it within the context of marriage, its faithfulness and fidelity. You can articulate it within the paleo, it's something different, it's something sort of something different. But fundamentally, that must be done. <laughs> That's one of the classical virtues, fortitude or long suffering. It's just the ability to, to be patient and to suffer uh, and to be faithful. You know? um, uh, and to, we are going to get there because it's, it's embedded in, in the marriage ceremony that most of us actually practice before marriage. Okay? We make certain vows which um, were articulations of our willingness to long want suffer. Okay, um, so romantic love in the context of the marriage covenant, which uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit more why this covenant I think is so important. Within which a man and a woman become one flesh by giving themselves and their gifts to each other and receiving the self and gifts of the other and themselves. Children have always been understood uh, as among these gifts growing from this love. These children are a kind of potentiality uh, that exists within a healthy marriage. Okay? Not every marriage actually um, is fulfilled with children or, or results in children, but the potentiality of fruitfulness is a part of the Christian notion of, of marriage uh, itself. Okay? 
So the covenant of marriage, I want to turn now to the covenant of marriage and, and talk a little bit more about how this works itself out. Um, the covenant of marriage is a means of grace. That's what it has always been understood to be um, in Christianity. It's a means of grace, and a means of grace makes it like a sacrament, which is why the Roman Catholics consider, actually, marriage to be a sacrament, because it is a particular sort of vessel through which God will change us, okay? It's a human institution or a human promise surrounded by certain boundaries and constraints through which God will actually work to change us. Um, so the, the covenant of marriage is a means of grace through which God forms a man and a woman in love. That's the classical understanding. Helping them to properly order all of their lives. Um, it's not just an arrangement of two people with common interests who are sexually attracted to one another who want to live together and enjoy certain sort of property rights together. Um, it is, in the Christian sense, it is a sacrament. Okay? Uh, it's an institution which forms us to be more like God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you don't know who he was, most of you, I'm not going to explain it right now, but he was a mid 20th century. I always say that. I'm not going to explain it that circle as much. Anyway, <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, was, was killed in the, in the last days of the Second World War. He was a famous uh, theologian, pastor in uh, Germany, and his, one of his, actually, it was his best friend, uh, Eberhard Bethgen, was going to marry his sister. And so he, he wrote these letters from prison which you can read in a little book called Letters and Papers from Prison. Um, so he was writing a letter to his brother, future brother-in-law, and he, and he gives him this advice. He says, Everhart, it is not your love that sustains your marriage, but from now on, the marriage that will sustain your love. In other words, once you enter into that promise, that covenant relationship, and consider yourself bound by it, that relationship will itself Provide the context for long suffering, okay? Um, for the patient enduring of, a, of another human being who is going to be irritating as all get out, okay? Um, uh, and insofar as you are able to, to put up with it, um, I'm being, I'm being hyperbolic, but um, over the long haul, uh, you will become more like Jesus Christ, okay? That is that is what this bond is for. Does that make sense to you okay? um, So the marriage itself is an institution which will teach you how to love. The purpose of marriage, according to the Bible, in the long history of Christianity, is for a married couple to grow in love, wisdom, and godliness through a common life pattern on the sacrificial love of Christ. And I do want to stop and say, I'm talking about love in the context of marriage, but any human commitment to another human being or other humans can become a kind of vessel for long-suffering and for growing in grace, okay? Um, and so we don't want to make this exclusive to marriage. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that can be applied widely. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33, offer us the deepest biblical commentary on the nature uh, of Christian love in the context of marriage. It's a famous passage you guys have all read before, so let me read what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. <clears throat> he says, Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And so the question is, how did Christ love the church? Why must husbands love their wives sacrificially? So how did, how did Christ love the church? Is a question. Simple, a simple question. What would you say? Cost him his life. It cost him his life. Um, that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, husbands. You enter into this context, okay? Uh, I don't think they had rings back then, but basically, once you put the ring on, you are willing to die for this spouse, this woman. Uh, that's the nature of your relationship to her from now on. And so then he goes on, and I'm, and I'm skipping around a bit here. He goes, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so he's offering a commentary on Genesis chapter 2 where we are told um, that when Adam and Eve are created and are joined together, they actually become one flesh uh, from, from, that, from that point forward. Um, they fulfill each other um, in, in, in a very natural uh, way. They become complementary to one another. Paul goes on to say, this mystery is a profound one, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And so what Paul is doing here, actually, is he's situating 
the marriage of every single man and every single woman in the context of Genesis chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 19, saying that the basic theology of creation informs the way we are to understand the relationship between a man and a woman in marriage, but also every marriage between a man and a woman is something like a shadow of the perfect image of Jesus Christ giving his life to the church. You guys understand what I'm saying? And so, so this, this human marriage is not itself perfect, but its perfection is to be found in the relationship between Jesus Christ and all the saints. Uh, and we know that that relationship is characterized by, first of all, Jesus' own self-giving of, of his life to the church, but then also uh, to the church's precept, reception of Christ into its own midst for its own life. And then he says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Um, let me make just a couple more comments about this. Uh, we, this is what we call typology. What's happening, what's happening here is typology. Every marriage is a type uh, of Christ and the church, and it's, it's to be understood that way. And there's really no way to evacuate the Christian understanding of marriage from the idea of, of sexual, um, I keep losing the word, <laughs> sexual distinction, okay? Um, the, the distinction of the sexes, uh, the differences that exist between a man and a woman, not only anatomical, which are obvious and natural, but also emotional um, uh, and, and everything else that goes along with it. This differentiation between the sexes is absolutely key to the Christian understanding of marriage um, because it's, it's presented there in Genesis 2. Um, and it's also kind of itself a shadow of the fullness of the difference that exists between Jesus Christ and the church. Okay? Now, one of the things that Christians have always said um, about marriage is that it's an institution which takes a very natural thing. And the very natural thing is, of course, first of all, eros, okay? uh, sexual passion, which exists for almost all people, I would imagine. Uh, the second thing is coupling and childbearing. It takes these very human things and it orders them to God. And the reason it does this is because sex has always been very dangerous. And what I mean by that is when a man or a woman have sex, babies have it. You guys all understand this, okay? Um, and so the institution of marriage is to take this natural thing, a man and a woman getting together, which may very well result in babies, and saying this very natural uh, relationship or set of relationships can be horribly abusive, okay, and horribly disordered. And it is horribly abusive and horribly disordered if a man has sex with a woman and then leaves her. And the reason why that's so horrible is because the woman then is left vulnerable. And in almost every society that ever existed, women and children are the most likely to suffer from massive injustice when the family breaks down. You guys with me? Okay? This is a huge problem. 95% of the children, no, I'm sorry, 75%, there's a truth to this, of the, of the children in Canton, Ohio, are born to single mothers. Okay? Did you guys know that? 75% of the city of Canton. That's the case in Youngstown as well. It's the case in Cleveland. Akron's doing a little bit better. Um, in our nation today, and this is no condemnation, it's no condemnation of women, um, it's, it's characteristic of culture, which is really missing sometimes. Um, nationwide, it's over 42% now. 42% of all of the childbirths are to uh, unmarried couples or to single, to single mothers. Now, this corresponds to increases in um, all kinds of abuse, child abuse, um, um, emotional and um, other kinds of abuses, future incarceration, drugs, uh, all those things. Because the reason is because, it, just very simply, it's really hard to be a single mother. Okay. You guys know that. Okay. So what Christianity does here is it says, listen, man, okay? Um, if you are going to engage in sexual relationships with this woman, then you better be able to stick with her forever and to care for her because she's going to need your care. And if you don't, then you will engage in the most massive kind of failure to love. You guys with me? And so the Christian institution of marriage just takes this very natural thing and says we can order this to the good of both the man and the woman and the child by requiring a lifelong covenant of fidelity. So that's what marriage is, and that's how it becomes a sacrament. Um, anyway, comments or questions about that? There's, the literature on this is vast and 2,000 years 
dwarf, uh, although for whatever reasons, uh, not often discussed in many contexts. Anybody have any, any thoughts or questions about that? You know, there's nothing magical about sex. Uh, and sex is just something that humans do, but sex is dangerous because of the consequences. And, and, and sex is especially dangerous um, uh, if it doesn't take place within the context of marital relationships because of what it does to women and children. And because it keeps men from fulfilling what God has ordained them to do. Anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions about this? Well, I'm sure this book completely tells us what our current society yes. has decided about that. Yes. And it is absolutely yes. not that. It is. And that is found to be foolish, yes. foolishness yes. in the current social structure. Yeah. This, the, oddly enough, um, since, and again, I'm not. But since the, since the invention of oral contraception um, and readily available abortion, the problem has gotten far worse. It was supposed to solve our problems, um, but the problem has become far worse. Which again means we don't, we, we've never learned to, to um, handle these technologies. You know? um, but what, what has happened is that an, an entire culture has come to see sex as primarily recreational activity. And marriage primarily is an institution wherein two people who are attracted to each other are able to have sex with certain legal and financial benefits. You know? um, and that's why, and again, please don't take me as being um, unkind, but that is, that only in this context, only in a kind of post-sexual revolution context, could we ever imagine that the, that the, the coupling of man and man could be the same as the coupling of man and woman, okay? These are, this is comparing apples to orangutans, not even apples to, you know, you know what I mean? These are two different things. Um, and Christians say, that the one uh, is the biblical view of a marriage. The other is something else. We don't have to condemn it. We certainly don't want to condemn a human being, but it's just not the same thing. It cannot possibly be the same thing. Does that make sense to you guys? Any pushback about that? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, first John, and then, and then Jeff. Oh. Okay. I think John, you have your hand up, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Would it be safe to say that any relationship? Sexual relationship that is originated out of self rather than out of God and His Word is a rejection of God. Yeah, I do think so. Um, I absolutely think so. We, you know, a human being is the closest thing to God that we encounter because we're made in the image of God. And so um, we should, like Moses before the burning bush, tread very carefully our relationship with other human beings. Um, that's kind of the idea. Without, without turning into God. Yeah. By the way, you're speaking about the passage from Ephesians and about how Christ uh, gave himself for the church, and uh, the ten one of the tangible ways that he did it was through his death. In, a, in the context of marriage, it seems to me that in order for a marriage to uh, be able to survive, Drive each individual within that covenant relationship has to be willing to die to self. If they don't, if they remain self-serving, then they're always going to be looking to that other individual to be trying to be something they can never be. You know, well, this my spouse doesn't make me happy anymore. My spouse isn't as attractive as they used to be, or you know, myriad things you could say, and they all end up being the demise of that of that uh, marriage. So it seems to me, until you know, die yourself in a marriage context, that there's no chance of a marriage surviving. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the? And this may get close to home for some of us because this is a very common phrase in our culture, but. Let's say you have a, a couple who decides to get divorced, and so they go to the kids and they say, Mommy and Daddy just don't love each other anymore. What does that mean, do you think, uh, in a Christian context? The kids are going to wonder if Mommy and Daddy's going to stop loving them. So That's it, yeah, yeah. But it, does it make any sense? Um, it, 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 does, it, is exactly, it doesn't make any sense, because um, the kind of love that is to be the bond that holds a man and woman together is not the kind of affection or eros that comes and goes. It's the kind of long-suffering uh, and self-giving um, within which 
eros and affection will ebb and flow throughout the years, um, uh, very naturally, uh, which is what happens to every, every relationship. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fundamentally nonsensical phrase. It doesn't make any sense. You might as well say, I stopped painting the number six in turquoise with a quizzler on the back of my head. <laughs> Meaning. That's exactly what I was going to say. So, you know, the, the point of all of this is that Christian marriage is very distinctive. There's a dense theological sort of framework within which we are to understand it, um, uh, but it has to be communicated. Uh, and it's, you know, I started out by saying I don't practice things very, these things very well, and that's true, I, I don't. I mean, I'm, um, but I can say that the theology of marriage has, has fundamentally um, in, it has meant a tremendous amount to me. Okay, uh, uh, just understanding what a marriage is, um, I think, has made me. Um, well, anyway, I don't entertain ideas like I don't love my wife. Anymore. I mean, that just never even pops into my head because I know exactly what that means. It means I need to fuck up, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 um, it, it has been a tremendous help. Clarifying things, avoiding mistakes, which is what theology is all about, is good for us. It's good for us. Yeah. I think it's such a big topic. There's so many variables in um, being humans, how we present. And just speaking on my own history, is like the difficulty to walk this walk. And um, what you're sharing here is such a learning life in relationships and the learning how to love and how to love God and then by there able to love in a marriage or partnership or then friendships and such and then we talk in um, society whether it be within our own churches, communities and such uh, the marriages come to that place where they're like saying things like well we're divorcing because we don't love each other anymore so going to the they they're not implementing learning or living how to love the agape love and it falling apart and then the people in those how they get affected but the struggle being as a Christian how we as Christians love those people who are breaking and broken and falling apart and don't have those pieces yet they haven't experienced it they don't know how to put it together it's like when people are going through those things, they're not at this level yet, and they're falling apart. How then they're met by the Christian world, like because their marriages break, the children, are, you know, all these things are falling apart in relationships with, we want to say, man woman relationships, marriage, and then same sex relationships. How Christians show God's love to the broken people. Yeah. Because sometimes you see it well done. Yeah. And then sometimes you see people who love God so much and really understand this become so passionate that it comes across hateful to those who don't get it and sure. can't live it and don't understand it yet that it pushes them away from God because when Christians are saying this is how it's supposed to be yeah. and not doing it in a loving manner. Sure. And it's just so I don't I, I don't think I have the ability to say everything I'm thinking smoothly. Mm -hmm. I know exactly I I think it's so hard because you can love people who are falling apart. Yeah. And you don't, you, you can't crucify them no. in the name of love of right. God. Right. You know, I love God so much, so you're no longer good enough. Right. Or, you know, they're, they're in same sex relationships, or, you know, they're in that my body is good, so I'm going to use it all the time. Yeah. You know, um, there, there's a teaching, teaching them how to love. Yeah, there's a principle at work here. And that, and it's, there, it's actually a principle which can be expressed just in one's own spiritual life, and that is, we can, and then expand it, but we will never make advances in our lives spiritually if all we do is try to avoid the sins that tempt us, you know what I mean? Um, it's like C.S. Lewis once said, we're all like children 
offered a holiday at sea, and we and we choose instead to go mucking about in a, in a, in a mud puddle. You know what I mean? We don't know about the holiday at sea. Um, and so in our own spiritual lives, if, if we've got these sins that we're trying to avoid, and all of our effort and focus is on avoiding those sins because they're bad for us, we don't ever make any progress. We have to have a vision of a life um, united to Christ, you know, transforming love. And it works this way with the church. The church's message is only bad. You know what I mean? You shouldn't do that. And here's how it destroys cultures, which it does. Um, our message can't possibly be effective. Effective. Christians require, though, we have to do a lot of work to be able to articulate the good news of the gospel for marriage, you know, um, uh, and for, uh, for everything else. I mean, we, we've got to be able to articulate the ways that, in fact, a Christian life is, is actually fulfilling uh, and is perfectly consonant with a flourishing human life. Does that make sense? And, and how you do that, I mean, like, we're having a, we're having a Christian church discussion here, right? Um, my public-facing ministry is very different from my sort of Christian facing ministry, that, if that makes sense. Um, hopefully you'll never find me railing up on Facebook about these issues, you know, um, because that is simply not the way to go about, about it. Um, it, it, it just takes tremendous um, care to have a witness which is healthy uh, and which does not repel people. Um, and, and I absolutely agree with you. And, and it's something that we should talk about and practice. And, um, very often Christians just need to keep their mouths shut you know, about some things um, and wait for the right opportunities to have, relation, to have, to have conversations. But, yes. You're not saying anything, but then how would like, the reintroduction force people into the church? How do you readjust people? Yeah, and there must be ways to. You don't want to, yeah. So even within the church, the conversation has to, yeah, it has to be attractive, right? Uh, it has to be kind and caring. The motivation has to be the, the flourishing of, of every human being. Um, and if you believe that this is good news, then we can have that kind of motivation. Yeah. Shannon? Well, I think it's good for both women and children. Yeah. Um, as an example, Greeks a lot louder, or at least compliment what you say. Yeah. You know, you can talk about it all you want, but if people don't see you as they're being out, they won't they won't listen. A really good um, a really good phrase. There was a, there was a missionary to India named Leslie Newbigin in the mid twentieth century, um, who who spent most of his life in India as a missionary. He came back to England. He was from England, and um, and he discovered that England had become Utterly secular, and it was a mission field. And so he wrote all these books um, uh, about what it means to live in a post Christian culture. Um, and, and one of the things he says, or one of the phrases that he came up with, was that the church has to be the hermeneutic of the gospel. In other words, people will simply misinterpret the words we say unless the church's life is somehow um, a representation of the words which we speak. And it really is the case that we can never avoid saying the words. Um, in fact, there's a the words aren't necessary. You know, we have to we have to say the words. Um, but then, if there's a tremendous inconsistency between the words and our actions, um, then we have a problem, and people will not understand our words. But often that just means humility and asking forgiveness and offering forgiveness and just love and presence and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm asking a question here. I don't mean this. What you're describing is something that takes a great deal of work. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I've noticed within my own lifetime is the way in which changes in technology and communication have evaporated people's sense of scale, yeah. such that everything is now a global problem or a cultural problem, rather than there being uh, anything that can be done on a personal or individual level. Do you see that dynamic? Well, like, is there some tension there that's preventing the church from actually rolling up its sleeves and stepping in to the things that it can do because you think we've got to fix these problems yeah. on a massive scale, which is simply yeah. not available to us as humans? Yeah. Actually, I was having breakfast with Ken and Tim not long ago. I was talking about, um, we were talking about, we were talking about the child issue, the 75% of 
person can. And um, I don't know what quite. I think Tim, you asked the question. I said, well, it has to start local, right? Uh, we've all come. We've all become convinced um, that national politics is the most important thing in the world, and that we must sort of solve all our problems on that scale. And that's wrong. And and I think one of the reasons why we think that is exactly what you're talking about. It started with. I don't know how many, many of you guys remember what I remember as a kid that is growing up and having the nightly news, which was um, 30 minutes of local news and 30 minutes of like global news. Um, and that's it, you know? Uh, and and you, so you could, you could learn about a few things, and you could read your local newspaper. You were not thinking about politics all day, every day. And then we had CNN, okay? Uh, uh, 24 hours of news. Uh, and then Fox News and MSNBC. Uh, so you wake up in the morning, you know, maybe you're, you're riding your exercise bike and you've got CNN or whatever on, um, and every headline starts with a dun, 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 you know, um, and then some terrible announcement about some catastrophe that must, you know, we must be concerned about. And so national news has become ubiquitous, and it's overwhelming, and it's really concerning. Um, and it's unnatural, okay? It's fundamentally unnatural. Uh, we need, we really do need to unplug. The truth is, our local communities are places where we can actually have an influence. Um, uh, first of all, in our homes and in our churches and, and in our local politics. Like local politics in North Canton is pretty good. It's really not that bad. Um, and you can, I, you know, uh, David Hill, before, you know, mayor of the group, I don't know, we love our kids grew up here. Um, and so you can have, you know, our, your local community is a place where you can have good discussions, talk about things. Anyway, um, yes. Yes, um, but but, uh, the, but the way we consume media has, has really messed the way messed us up. Uh, we think that we need to be concerned about things um, on a global scale all the time, and we just can't. And I would actually suggest, at least with regard to our nation, our, our national politics will be much healthier if we focus more on our local politics. Um, and, and unfortunately, that, that we've, we've really gone astray. All right, let me move on, guys. I'm, I've got a little bit more to say. Back to marriage. <laughs> um, uh, let me just read through this. Okay, this is from, you guys probably know I'm an Anglican priest, and so the, the Book of Common Prayer has got what's called a marriage rite. Okay, and so anytime that you're married in the context of an Anglican church service, um, there, is, there is a marriage ceremony that we go through. And that marriage ceremony is the basis of most Christian marriages in America. And so most of you guys, when you were married, you don't know it, probably, but you actually said words in which were written in the 17th century uh, in which were in the Book of Common Prayer. because It's, it's become the basic rite for, for marriage generally. Um, so I'm going to read through that rite and uh, just show you the deep theology which has always been embedded uh, in sort of the Western understanding uh, of a marriage. Okay? So this is sort of an inter introduction which begins the service. And I don't have the whole, the whole rite here, just a few selections, but... So I will stand up and I will say, uh, Dearly beloved, we have gathered together in the presence of God to witness and bless the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Almighty God established the bond of the covenant of marriage in creation as a sign of the mystical union between Christ and the church. Here's see Ephesians 5. Um, your marriage is, is encapsulated by Genesis 2 um, uh, and Revelation 19. Our Lord Jesus Christ adorned this manner of life by his presence, the first miracle of the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And it is commended by Holy Scripture to be held in honor of all people. The union of a husband and wife of heart, body, and mind was ordained by God for the procreation of children and their nurture and the knowledge and love of the Lord. The procreation of children, even though some marriages will not end up in children, is a strong potentiality in every covenant of a man and woman. Um, and it's always been fundamental to the way we understood the necessity of for mutual joy and for the help and comfort given one another in prosperity and adversity, to maintain purity so that husbands and wives, with all the household of God, might serve as holy and undefiled members of the body of Christ, and for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and family, church, and society, to the praise of his holy name. Therefore, marriage is not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, deliberately, and in accordance with the purpose for which it was ordained. By Almighty God. <clears throat> and then I skip over to the vows. And so look at the vows that many of you guys may have said words very much like this, or maybe I could have like been some form of this. Um, I won't pick on anybody. In class, I actually will have students stand up on a very good. But uh, I, 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 do it, I don't do the, I don't go all the way. <laughs> uh, 
because that's an Angular Snake connection. Um, all right, so and so, uh, will you have this woman to be your wife to live together out of reverence for Christ and the covenant of holy matrimony? Will you love her, honor her, comfort and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live? In other words, will your love be long suffering, sacrificial? Uh, the man says, I will. Okay? Just profound and urge, the statement of, I will keep this promise. Uh, turning to the woman, will you have this man to be your husband? To live together out of reverence for Christ and the covenant of holy matrimony, will you honor him, love him, comfort and keep him in sickness and in health and forsaking all others, be faithful to him as long as you both shall live? I will. Will all of you witnessing these promises do all in your power to uphold this man and this woman in their marriage? In other words, will you be a community whose understanding of a marriage is not dictated by Hollywood, okay, or social media, but by the Christian teachings uh, about marriage? Will you have those expectations and make sure that this man and this woman are surrounded by those expectations so that they might flourish in their marriage? That's the responsibility of all of us. Um, in relation to every marriage. <clears throat> um, we will, the whole congregation says. So, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, you, you guys see the theology. Okay? Um, and of course we'd say much more. Let me, let me finish up by, by just making a couple of broad theological comments about love. The love of God and the love of others always go together in the scripture. Again, 1 John chapter 4 says, those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and their sisters also. The reason why Paul's or John's logic works this way, again, is because you have in front of you a person created in the image of God, okay? Okay? And so if you cannot love that person created in the image of God, then your claims to love God himself are a lie. Um, uh, you can't not love humans and love God. In, uh, by the way, the, in C.S. Lewis's um, Weight of Glory, maybe you guys have read this wonderful sermon that he, that he wrote um, during the Second World War, he finishes it by saying something along the lines of the, the, the person next to you um, is the most sacred thing available to your senses. And then he says, except for the Holy Sacrament, okay, because he's very, he's an Anglican, uh, Catholic, very Catholic Anglican. Um, but this is what he means, okay? Uh, the person next to you uh, is, is holy, okay? It's, it's sacred in the sense that you have the image of God there. Uh, the covenant of marriage kept by a man and a woman in fidelity sustains love and conforms us to God in Christ. Love then, and this is important, love is not simply a command we must, we must obey. Um, the title of this theme, or the theme of this month, is Love and Obedience, Living a Life of Love and Obedience. We should never think that we are sort of commanded to love and then also to obey. Love is not so much a command that we must obey. It's more than that. It's more organic than that. It's not as though God says, okay, you must love, um, uh, and if you love, then I'm going to like approve of you. It's, it's much more organic than that. Love, um, God is love. So to love another is to, as 2 Peter puts it, to be a participant of the divine nature. Because love, in the Christian sense, is itself divine. Um, love of others is tangible, and it's real. It is a matter of willing and doing. Thus, the love of God is tangible and real. It's a matter of willing and doing. In all of our relationships, in other words, we have the opportunity to know and abide in the love of God. And Christian teaching, Christian theology, is meant to help us sort of carry this knowledge with us in our relationships, okay? To sort of properly order and inform those relationships. And so again, the covenant of marriage, as one example has always been understood in this context, and should be still, I would argue, but so has every relationship that we engage in, okay? Uh, it sort of bears this weight uh, with it. That's all. <laughs> that's, that's all. Uh, any, any comments or questions, guys? Yeah, John. I was just thinking that uh, I think we were going to some conversation that initiates here. But before anything was, we were dividing it, we loved each other. It was very dynamic, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Not that it was to us. 
and an in relationship doesn't make it genuine. The difference between the diamond of the and the sort of payment. Okay, a false and real. And you get the value of the fact that you're making that image of that love. Yeah. And it comes from love that you can love. That's right. So that to me is just the difference that makes a difference. It must be a difference. That's a great point. Remember last time we talked about prayer, and I, and I began that lecture with the Trinity, uh, this idea that there's communication between the members of the, of the Godhead. Um, and the same is true of love. God is love eternally, which means that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are engaged in an eternal relationship of self-giving and receiving. And so we are invited to actually become participants of the divine nature. That's what Second Peter is talking about. Um, uh, love is one of the ways that we do that. So good. Very good. Um, why don't I close with prayer? And if you, if you, if any, any other questions before I do that, guys? All right. Um, so remember, we'll go on to our small groups. And if you're a visitor here today, then you, you're welcome to stick around. Um, so, uh, Father in heaven, we are grateful to you. So, been made in your image, um, we, we're, we're grateful that you reveal yourself to us, especially in your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and taught us how to love. Um, may our lives, in response to Christ, be loving. We love you, and may we love others uh, who are made in your image. Uh, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.